Does the roticotine patch prevent or even treat augmentation for restless leg syndrome? The answer is an emphatic no. I'm Dr. Andy Burkowski with Relax Health. Dopamine agonists are medications that have been used to treat restless leg syndrome for more than two decades. And the biggest concern with these drugs and why they are no longer recommended, including in the upcoming 2024 clinical guidelines, is that they tend to worsen the condition with long-term use. The longer an individual is on the medication, the higher the dose of dopamine agonists, the worse the condition will get over time. The symptoms will come on earlier. They will start to break through the medication dose. It could spread to other areas of the body and it could be very difficult to sit through very short activities without developing restless legs. These are terrible symptoms, and the drug cannot just be stopped because it will cause drug withdrawal. The brain becomes chemically dependent on these drugs to provide dopamine to the brain. So it's not just like stopping the medication and moving on to a different one the next day. Typically, it requires a long tapering process of several weeks to months to get off of these medications. Transdermal rotigotine, which goes by the brand name Nupro in the U.S., is slightly newer than the previous two, Pramipexol and Ropinerol, that came out in the early 2000s. This drug is in a patch form, so it's applied to the skin, and it basically delivers the dopamine agonist 24-7. Many physicians and clinicians have touted this drug as being able to treat or reverse augmentation and that it's a lower risk of augmentation if one uses this over pramipexol and ropinerol. This is factually just not true. This uh, medication is a long-acting drug. The hallmark symptom of augmentation is that the symptoms start to come on earlier and earlier during the day when the pramipexol and the ropinerol are not in one system. If you give the same drug 24 seven, the drug is always in the system. So it doesn't actually reduce the augmentation, it masks the augmentation. Only then the symptoms will eventually break through the masking and come out anyway down the line. So it really is a stopgap measure to switch from ropinerol or pramipexol to the rotigotine patch. The theory behind it was that, oh, it's a slow release, long acting drug. It's less likely to damage the dopamine system and cause augmentation, but that has not been the case. So let's look at some of the research, and this is not relatively new research. So one of the original studies of this drug in 2011 by Ertl uh, and others showed that within a five year period, 13% of individuals in this observational wing of the study developed augmentation in less than five years. So despite the fact they were taking the drug to mask the earlier onset of symptoms, they still broke through at least 13%, whatever they deemed as clinically significant. I don't know what the non-clinically significant number is, but that's what they put uh, in this publication. And these will be in the notes for this video if you'd like to read the study. On top of that, this was a drug-funded study by the makers of the rotigotine patch, and every single author of the study was either a paid consultant or was getting financial reimbursement. So their interpretation of the data that they were providing may be suspect, and that's part of the issue with the perpetuation of some of these treatments, is that a lot of people were heavily financially invested in these treatments, whether for their research careers or financially itself. Then there was a study in 2017 by Trenkwalder and others, and this one looked at rotigotine specifically to treat augmentation in those with augmentation from the other dopamine agonist medications. Overall, they concluded that this was an effective treatment of augmentation. But then they also noted in their discussion that 51% of the individuals in this trial had at least one dose increase of the rotigotine patch during this one year. And why would they have a dose increase if this was a stable, effective drug? 
Well, most likely they were developing augmentation and the dose had to increase, but that's not what the authors said. They said, quote, medication changes are common in restless leg syndrome, end quote. I think most restless leg specialists like myself do not see other treatments needing dose increases at a rate of 51% uh, per year. And I think that this is, again, another drug company funded study where all the authors were funded by the same company. And I'm not against the drug companies supporting research, but you have to take the interpretations with a grain of salt. So when the drug company is telling you it treats augmentation and you see the statistics behind it, you have to be suspicious. So what are the challenges with people who are on the rotigotine patch to begin with? It's a little more difficult to get off of it when somebody develops augmentation because the patch it can't be uh, split into different dose increments. It's sort of three milligrams, two milligrams, one milligram, and then off. So some people have to jump right from one milligram to being completely off the drug, which causes quite a bit of dopamine withdrawal. And a lot of people do not tolerate this. Occasionally, restless leg specialists will convert an individual from the one milligram patch to another short-acting uh, dopamine agonist like pramipexol and, or ropinirol in order to taper them off the rest of the dose. But the bottom line is clinicians should not be switching people to this patch with the hopes of eliminating augmentation. It's only kicking the can down the road and it's gonna present the same problem and only buy the patient a few months at, at the most, even if it's the right dose of the rotigotine patch. So the bottom line is dopamine agonists are not recommended, rotigotine included. If an individual is developing augmentation on rotigotine, they need to use the other recommended treatments to help get off of the rotigotine patch, which can be challenging. As always, these videos are for general information only and do not constitute the practice of medicine. All decisions about dopamine agonists should be made under the guidance of a knowledgeable and licensed medical professional. And as I like to say, one of the keys to sleeping well is to relax.